Well, good evening. Welcome to week nine of the story of Scripture, understanding the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And, you know, as I was preparing this and, and thinking about how we would present this material, it's kind of amazing how far we've come. Um, you know, nine weeks ago, it shows that we've been in kind of this, uh, uh, apart from the, the body and gathering together as a group for a long time. Time goes by quick, so I hope you're enjoying your summer. I hope you enjoyed these, these, this series that we're in right now, that you're learning a lot. I know that I have. I mean, it has put things together just in a much clearer way for me as I've gone through this. Um, so maybe tonight you're you're got a bowl of ice cream and and you're watching and and growing with us. And and again, this whole goal and all of this really is for your relationship with Christ to deepen, to appreciate Him more, um, and to become changed, to become transformed more and more into the image of Christ. So um, I, I hope that this class will will allow you to do that and, and aid you in doing that. So. Um, Again, we're in week nine. Um, just a, a little bit of review. And also, you can catch up online, too, if you've missed uh, one or more of these. All of them are archived under the past messages. There's a special place for toolbox classes now. Um, and then also, you can, you can get the notes as well on there. So just as a quick review, again, this is hopefully ingrained in, into you by now. But the 512 5512 Four one twenty one one. So five twelve five five twelve four one twenty one one. We've seen how that's really the way that that our modern Bible, that our our English Bible, is comprised of the Old Testament, five books in the Pentateuch, um, then the twelve history books. Um, there's five books of of poetry, five books of the major prophets, and five books of the minor prophets. Tonight we're actually going to be talking about the prophets. So those last two sections, those last seventeen books of the um, Old Testament, but remember there were the five major prophets and the, five, and the 12 minor prophets, and really those, those aren't important, uh, they're not weighted as far as importance, but it just basically is saying the length of the books. The five major prophets, the books are longer than the 12 minor prophets. So um, we have gone through the Pentateuch, we start off and we saw the creation story and how, how there is one God who spoke and the world came into existence and his creation was good. Uh, mankind is the, the epitome, the apex of creation. Then we read about in Genesis chapter 3 how, how sin entered the picture, and that was a problem, sin and death. Where there is sin, there is death. And, and it was a problem that we cannot overcome. It's a problem that we need help. So we have to throw our hope and, and all, of our, you know, all, all of our understanding to realize that, that we can't fix our problem but only God can, the perfect God. And fortunately, he spoke into his creation, and he's working on a plan to, to restore and to fix the problem of sin. And, and his word never is void, and, and he will never fall back on his word, and that will come to pass. But we saw in Genesis chapter 12, you know, and, and on, and which we'll talk about in a minute, but several covenants that, that we'll get back to. But again, in the Pentateuch, um, we saw kind of this history of of. of the people of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham, all the way through Joseph. Then we moved in to the history section. So we had the five books of the Pentateuch, then the 12 books of history, which we're still in the midst of, um, is this narrative. But we saw that, that it, as God had made promise to his people, how they started to, to come into the promised land and, and take conquest of that land. We read about the judges, um, and we're in the time of kings right now. Um, and we saw, you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, how God had spoken to the people and promised blessing if they followed him, saw that he promised curses if they did not. Um, then we moved in, I believe it was a couple weeks ago, into the poetry section, um, the five books of poetry. So we had the five books of the Pentateuch, 12 books of history, which were still in the middle, then the five poetry books. And, and we saw how they, they were really a guidebook on how we can worship our amazing creator God, our covenant God. And also how we can live in wisdom with one another. So um, those, are, those are very practical books. And then as I said tonight, we will be getting into uh, the, the major prophets and the minor prophets just in a general way. Remember, we're covering 39 books of the Old Testament in nine weeks. And we could spend weeks on every single book. But um, we're just getting a general overview of how scripture flows so that when you read it on your own, um, you get an understanding of how it's put together and, and where you'll be able to do those things. So we're going to... We're going to move on um, tonight into, into week nine, um, and a couple of objectives that I wanted to mention. One is that, that we want to just understand the role of the prophets, um, what they played, and, and how they, they work things through. Um, and then we also want to identify the new covenant spoken of by these prophets. 
So we're going to talk, we've talked about several covenants, which we'll get into here in just a moment. But there's a new covenant that's kind of shrouded in a little mystery, kind of hidden, kind of mysterious that, that these prophets begin to speak about. Um, but it's also, if you remember, again, in that 512, 5512, remember we have the Torah that, that, that talks about Abraham and his descendants. And then we continue on with that in the history section. So those first 17 books is kind of a chronological order of what we're going through. And we talked about if we could wrap our arms around the five poetry books and then the, the major and minor prophets, if we could take those and pick them up and drop them in, we would drop them into the history section. So it gives us context of what, of what they're speaking about. So those are, those are the objectives that we want to go through tonight. But um, again, getting back to review is where we're at in the history section of all of this. We, we talked about um, over the last few weeks the United Kingdom. So we had a time of, of kings where the people of Israel, um, they asked God basically in rejection of God that they wanted to be like the other nations around them and they wanted a king to guide them. And we saw about the first king, King Saul, how the people chose him and it started off okay, but it didn't end well. Um, then God anointed a king, King David, who was a man after God's own heart. And, and um, it was really a time of, of, of a united kingdom during the time of King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and specifically under King David and King Solomon, it was really a time of prosperity for the nation of, of Israel, and, and a lot of things were going on, and there was some covenant faithfulness, and they were being blessed pretty much, but we saw uh, how, how through King Solomon, um, while he was a wise king, and there's a word that describes him, and it's wisdom, he was, wisdom, he was wise in his civic duties, and and really how he governed and made treaties and, and trades and, and different things with, with different nations. But morally, um, he, and how he related to God, he was unwise. And really, through his leadership, the kingdom um, fell. And covenant judgment came on. And we've talked about that in Deuteronomy chapter 28, that if the people were faithful um, to, to the Mosaic covenant, which was the law for the land, if they would follow God, if they would do their part, that God would bless them according to Deuteronomy chapter 28. But if, he didn't, if, the, if Israel rejected God and, and, and went after idols and foreign gods and rejected the law of God, that there would be consequences for that and there would be curses upon them. And, and really, as we've read through the Old Testament, as you read through it, you see that played out in, in the nation of Israel. When times were good, they were following God. They were being obedient to their part of the, the Mosaic Covenant. And, and when things were, were not going well, when foreign invaders would come, when there was famines in the land, when, when food wasn't being produced in the way that it should, um, then it was because of this Deuteronomy chapter 28 where God said there, there's going to be a price to pay when you don't fulfill your obligations. So the kingdom uh, was divided after King Solomon. And uh, we talked last, I believe it was last week, about how the northern kingdom, uh, Israel, was taken over by the, the Assyrians in 722 B.C., and the people were exiled. And we could read about that in 2 Kings chapter 17. Then we also saw that, that they were led during their time before the fall, that there was not one good king in the entire northern um, portion of, of Israel, this northern kingdom, um, whose capital was Samaria. And then, and then we, we read about and we talked about Judah, the southern kingdom. And they had a few good kings mixed in, but overall, they, most of their kings were, were bad as well. And, and because they had a few good kings, the judgment was delayed a little bit, but came uh, 586 B.C., they were taken over by the Bab Babylonians. And the people were exiled out of the land, and Jerusalem, the capital city, was ransacked. And, um, and so it was just a time of, of questioning. Um, people had not followed God, and there were the consequences to pay, but how was God going to be faithful to some of the covenants that he had given to his people? And um, that, that's kind of where we're at right now in this divided period, in this time period after the, um, in the midst of and after the judgment from God where, where the people have been basically expelled out of the land, the divided kingdom uh, of Israel. And I want to read um, what God said in Leviticus chapter 18. And he gives a promise um, in Leviticus. And, and, uh, and again, now we are going back. Um, you know, we're in the time of the kings right now in our, in our history timeline but I want to go back, and this would have been back when, we, when the people were wandering in the desert before they had go, come into the promised land, after God had led them out of Egypt. And uh, God had some things to say to the people as they learned to, to revere him and to worship him and to, um, and to realize that he is a holy and perfect God and, and we are not. And, and there's a payment for sin and all the sacrificial system that we talked about. But in the midst of this in Leviticus, this is, 
This is what it says, in, starting with verse, um, chapter 18, verse 24. It says, do not defile yourselves in any of these ways. This is basically you know, God speaking through Moses and through priests and things to the people of Israel. It says, do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native-born and the foreigners residing among you must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. So God gives us, um, through the writers, through Moses, gives us some very um, uh, kind of a grotesque picture of expulsion where God says, if you do not you know, follow my ways, if you go after the ways of these foreign nations, I will literally spit you out of my mouth. I will vomit you out of the land. I will be disgusted. And, and, and so again, when we now jump head back to, you know, to the time of this divided kingdom, um, after the time of Solomon, when kings for, for several years were, were bad, um, this came to pass. They were vomited out of the land. They were kicked out of the land at the hands of the Assyrians and of the Babylonians. So that, again, that gives us some context of where we're at. In the midst of this, Again, in the times of these kings that we, that we would write, read about in the book of Kings, um, first and second Kings, in, in the midst of this, there were, there were prophets that would come and, and speak to, to nations and to individuals. And sometimes it was the northern kingdom. Sometimes it was the southern kingdom. Sometimes it was even to nations around them. But we had prophets that spoke into this time period. And there were some prophets that were pre-exile. So in other words, they... They said, hey, remember Deuteronomy chapter 28. Remember the promises that you made to God throughout Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus. And, and remember what God has said. If you, if you don't uphold your end of the bargain, if you, if you don't um, follow after God, if you don't obey the law, then he will spit you out and there's going to be consequences and you will be kicked out of the land. So these prophets would come during this time before you know, the Assyrians or the Babylonians came in and they would be having a specific time period and they would, they would speak to people and said, hey, there is a time of judgment coming and you need to repent. You need to turn back and to the one true God, the covenant God that, that you have made an agreement with and you need to follow him and obey his law. Otherwise, judgment is coming. And then there were also prophets that came up during the exile, during this time when the, when the people had been vomited out of the land, when they were in um, Assyria and, and, and Babylon and these different areas where they were, they were no longer in the land of promise that God had, had told them that they would have through Abraham. So they would, they would speak into that time frame. And again, the prophets had a message and they said, destruction is here. And again, their message was still to repent, to repent. And then we'll probably talk a little bit more about this next week. But um, there were also prophets that spoke to the post-exile time period. Because see, as, as Israel was, you know, moved out into these foreign lands by these foreign invaders, invaders, God was still faithful and he was going to bring them back. And there was a time period where they started to come back. And we'll go through a little bit of that next week. And, and there were prophets that spoke into that. And the message was still the same. Hey, look and see what happened. Now you still need to repent. You need to follow the one true God. Things are not the way that they're supposed to be. So th those are kind of the prophets. And the main thing that we can get from the prophets is that they, their message was repentance. Hey, follow God. If not, there is going to be judgment. Right now you can turn around and, and follow him and there will be a time of blessing. But, but judgment is coming if you do not heed my words. And these prophets, they were, they were strange. And really their, their lives were living parables. And God had them do some pretty wild things. And again, if you read through these prophet sections, and I, and I will tell you, the 17 books, the prophets, they're, they're a hard read. Um, they're not necessarily in chronological order. We're, we're not always familiar with the history of what's going on. And, and they use strange language. And again, God has them do strange things. And, and they say all kinds of, of, of wild things. And and they're, they're exposed publicly. Often, oftentimes, a lot of them were killed. Um, they weren't real popular with the people. When you have a message of repent, turn around, otherwise there's going to be destruction and calamity come upon you. They're not real popular people speaking the word of God. So uh, uh, not an easy section really to read. 
Um, but again, we can glean some amazing things as, as we go through it. So I put a chart up on that I think that they're going to have um, on the screen for you and, and as well as in your notes. And, and we're not going to go through it, but I just wanted you to understand it lists kind of the time period. It lists who was the king of, of Judah, which remember was the southern kingdom with, with Jerusalem as its capital. And then also the northern kingdom, the kings of Israel. Um, where Samaria was their capital. And, and remember, all the kings of Israel, every single one of them was bad. Um, almost all the kings of Judah were bad, and they led the people astray. And, and the nation often goes as leadership goes. And, um, and so, again, this, this troubled time period of the kings. And then also I've got a column there where the, the specific prophets that were speaking into those specific time periods. So, again... We might come back to this next week, I'm not real sure, but I just put it on there because I want you to understand that these are real situations, and these are real people, these are real kings, it's a time in history, and, and the prophets were speaking into specific situations with a specific message for a specific group of people. So um, you can use that and, and reference that as you want to kind of keep some things um, fresh in your mind, but... But again, the kings, these prophets, a lot of them, if we, if we could pick up their books and drop them into the history section, much of the time frame of the, of the prophets speaking um, would be through in 1 Kings 12 all the way through the end of, of the book of 2 Kings, which chronicles a lot of those things that are on that chart. So, and again, the dominant message that we want to remember for, for the prophets was to repent. But as we're also going to see tonight, there was also another message mixed in that was a little shrouded, that was a little mysterious, that, that, that's not super clear cut, but it was a, a message of love and a better day is coming and God is not done. So we'll, we'll get into that in just a moment. But I want to re go back again now, just because it's relevant for what we're going to be speaking about for the rest of our time together. Um, but to remember that we're dealing with here with a covenant God. So we have a God that, that, that makes promises. We have a God that deals with people specifically, and we've seen a lot of those covenants. So I want to remind you of the, the definition of what a covenant is. And, um, and we've gone through this several times, but it, it's a legal term denoting a formal and legally binding declaration of benefits to be given by one party to another with or without conditions attached. In other words, conditional or unconditional. We've spent a lot of time in that. So this agreement between two parties, and sometimes it's, it's conditional where there are strings attached. Both parties have to fulfill something. Um, sometimes it's unconditional. And we've seen a few examples of them. So the first example, again, because it's so key to our understanding of, of the entire narrative of Scripture, but it's the Abrahamic covenant. And we read about that, and I've mentioned it often, in, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. We understand that to be an unconditional covenant, that God is making a promise. And, and while Abraham was, was a great man and, and, and followed God often, he was also a sinful man. And fortunately, this covenant was not based upon whether Abraham was totally obedient or not. Um, because, and obviously God wants obedience, but this was a promise from God for a people, that he would raise up a people, he would give them a land, and, and through them they would become a worldwide blessing. And, um, and, and we can bank on that. God is faithful to his word, and we've seen how he started to fulfill that. And, and, and it continues on, and it's not going to be completed until we know the answer, the one true Messiah, Jesus, comes. But the Abrahamic covenant. Then we also saw the Mosaic covenant, which was really the law for the land. And we read about that in, in Exodus chapter 20 on through, through Exodus chapter 24. And that was a conditional covenant. This agreement between God and, and the nation of Israel. And God basically said, look, if you follow my law, if you, if you do not seek out idols, if I'm your one true God, you put me above all others. And, and we read about the Ten Commandments and all kinds of other laws that went along with that. But this was a, a conditional covenant. The people in Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, they said, we will obey, we will follow, we will, we will keep our end of the bargain. And God basically told them, and we've read about it in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, that if they followed it, blessing, you know, if they kept their part of it, this conditional covenant, the blessing would follow the nation. If they did not, then curses would come down. And as we read just a little while ago, God would vomit them out of the land. But that was the Mosaic covenant, a conditional covenant. And then we read um, a few weeks back in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, another covenant, and this was the Davidic covenant. And, um, and this was a covenant that God made with King David. And basically, King David had gone to God and said, I want to build you a, a house, you know, where your presence can reside among the people and, and build this great temple. And God said, 
and kind of took his words and, and, and spit them back out to him and said, you're wanting to build me a house. You know, I don't really need a house, but what I'm going to do is build a house. And he was per- referring specifically to a people. And he said, David, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, through one of your ancestors, through your seed, um, I'm going to have someone sit on the throne from the line of David, um, sit on the throne and reign forever, a king like you've never seen, that, that from everlasting to everlasting. And, and, and again, kind of shrouded and kind of mysterious. And David was in awe and wondered, how could, how could this great king who is from you know, beginning to end reign? And, and how could someone from his line be on the throne forever? And again, we'll see how that unfolds as we get to the New Testament. But that was the Davidic covenant. And so we've seen, and that was an unconditional covenant. Because again, as we saw, David was a man after God's own heart and did some great things for God. And when he was, was, you know, when he was confronted with his sin, he repented. And, um, and, but yet, you know, there was also areas of his life that were very messed up. And so fortunately, this idea that, that God would, would raise up a mighty king who would reign and, and have a kingdom that would last forever uh, was not conditional upon how David responded or even David's um, descendants after him. So now we're going to move on to a new covenant. Because again, as, the, as these prophets speak, um, they're speaking into a, a time of, of uh, you know, for the most part, a, a time of disturbing news for the nation of Israel, this time of, of, of covenant unfaithfulness. And consequences are taking place that, 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 are, that are not going well for the nation of Israel, as, as God had said. And so Jeremiah uh, is one of the prophets, and we're, we're going to read from him. But um, Jeremiah was a prophet that spoke prior to the time and during the time of the fall of Jerusalem, the fall of the southern kingdom of Judah. So this would have been around 586 um, B.C. And again, I, I want us to understand that the prophets, they're, they're, they're a little strange. They're, they're kind of ADD, the chronology, the order of, of things are a little confusing. So as we read this, it, it, it can be a little bit tough. But um, we start to see in their message, it's not just about repent, about judgment, but also about a time where God is going to continue to fulfill promises in a way that maybe none of us could ever imagine. A little hidden, a little shrouded, a little mysterious, doesn't make full sense until we get to the New Testament. But we're going to move on in this this Jeremiah passage from Jeremiah chapter 31 um, and verses uh, 31 through 34. So it starts off with verse 31. It says, the days are coming, declares the Lord. So again, I want us to understand God would speak through the prophets. Um, He would raise up specific people that would speak for God. And and, uh, during this time of of really of judgment. So uh, this starts off with Jeremiah saying, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. So, So he is saying, this is the word of God. And he's describing something that that is to come. He doesn't say when this is going to happen. He says it's sure to pass, but it's not passed yet. This is a new covenant. We have to understand this is a new covenant compared to what? And he's comparing this to the old covenant in in reference to the Mosaic covenant. This idea of the people trying to follow this law um, that that we've seen in the story, and we will continue to see in the story, that was um, really not possible for the people to do. And so we've also seen these promises that God has, again, made to David and to, and to Abraham. And, and we're seeing kind of this tension as how is this working out where the Mosaic Covenant, where there are consequences to this, and, and the people have been kicked out of the land, and, and yet God has said that I will raise up you know, a king that will, that will reign forever, and that you will be a worldwide blessing, a people, and a land. How is this all going to work out? How is this all going to work out? So we move on in verse 32. It says, this covenant will not be like the covenant made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. So remember, he's talking about this Mosaic covenant that we've studied and read about in the book of, of Exodus. Because they broke my covenant, he says. See, the people had, had broken the covenant that they had made in, in Exodus chapter 20, verses, you know, in chapter 20 through 24. He says, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. See, we start to see this, this kind of love side of God, and it's always been there, but um, you know this, this this covenant idea and these things. There's kind of legal language, and but now all of a sudden he he moves into almost marriage type language, and God is this jilted lover, and Israel and Judah oftentimes are pictured among the prophets as 
is an unfaithful wife. God was good on his word, but Israel's rejected him. They've prostituted themselves with with other idols. They've cheated on God. And we start to see this this love language among the prophets, along with this message of repent and judgment, comes where, where we see really the heart of God, that he's hurt. And that he longs for a deep and and loving relationship with his people. Verse 33 says, this is covenant that I will make with the people of Israel. And as we saw earlier, he had mentioned mentioned earlier up, and and I didn't mention it, but the people of Israel and Judah in 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 verse 31. So Jeremiah is speaking about the two um, separate, you know, divided kingdom. And, and how, you know, he's starting to make this promise. But here he just mentions just the people of Israel. So in other words, kind of shrouded as this is the idea that these two will become one again. And um, there is a better day coming where there will be one kingdom, one nation um, under God. Right? So verse 33 again, it says, This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. He says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And again, I want us to understand there's, you know, Jeremiah is speaking into a a specific group of people, into a specific time. But at the same time, he's also speaking into something that is coming that, that, that would be many hundreds of years later. So it's mysterious, it's shrouded, it's, it's really, at that time, it, it had to be a little strange, and it was this kind of ongoing revelation that God was saying, hey, I've made promises with you, um, you've made promises to me, you've failed, I will not fail on my word. You know, there's this tension of how um, there are consequences, but yet, how is God's um, unconditional promises going to be worked out? And, and so he starts to give, through the prophets, this message of a, of, of a, a new covenant, a covenant that people probably couldn't even quite grasp. But, but um, again, just kind of the mystery, and, and we get just these nuggets of them. And, and we need the New Testament, really, to decipher. We need the story of Jesus to decipher all of this. But, but they're talking about an era that has come that will be a different covenant. We move on. It says, I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. So um, really what we're, what we're talking about here is... is is God making a new covenant. And again, we, we're going to see more about that when we get into the Gospels. Um, and Jesus said that his blood is the, the blood of the new covenant. Um, but, but basically, God makes a, a promise here and a few other scriptures that we're going to go through here in, in just a moment. Um, but he, he makes a, a promise, a, a new covenant. And basically what he's saying is that, that I will be your God and you will be my people and I will live among you. And he says it in different language, different, different ways, but um, we're, we're starting to see hints of this. So he, he raises up these people. If we move on, in another prophet, Ezekiel, speaking. Um, and, and again, I'm just going to give a, just a hint of this because it's going to make more sense, and we could spend weeks and weeks on this. But tonight's lesson is going to be pretty short just to understand the message uh, of these prophets. But Ezekiel chapter 36 says this. I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Remember, the people are are in exile now. It says, and I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and, and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. He, he, he starts to say how his word is going to be fulfilled, how he will build this kingdom, how he will, he will have this this kingdom and, and this king who will reign forever and be a worldwide blessing and, and how he will develop uh, citizens of the kingdom. It says, I will give you a new heart and, and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, this idea of rebirth and, and resurrection that again, we, we know because we get the advantage of looking back, but to people thinking, what is he talking about? How is this going to work out? And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and, and to be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land that I gave your ancestors and you will be my people and I will be your God. Because again, remember in reference the new covenant versus the Mosaic covenant, the people needed new hearts. They, they could not keep God's law. They failed over and over again. And while they, they were held accountable and they should have been, there was, 
it was futility and and again there was judgment and and different things because the people did not follow God uh, but there was going to be a day coming where, where God would give his spirit to where he would enable his people in his kingdom under the reign of the perfect king who would live forever in the line of David um, how, how he would give them new hearts and new birth Ezekiel we move on in chapter 37 says I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. And, and again, Jesus later on comes into the scene speaking about the kingdom of God and, and how really this kingdom, this land, is, is not so much a physical place, but it's, it's saturated and, and invades the entire world. Then we move on in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 29. It says, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So we see how, how there's, you know, again, these prophecies and these promises of a king who is to come. And we know that as Jesus. But then we also know that, that Jesus came onto the scene and, and he said, it's to my benefit, you know, to his people that I leave and I will send you my spirit. And, and then the spirit of God, God himself will reside in people throughout the entire world and build this kingdom and, and our king will be the one in the line of David, the perfect king, the Messiah, the one true king who, who could forgive our sins once and for all and fulfill all of the promises and fulfill the sacrificial system and all the things that we've been reading about. A glorious message, the message of good news. And this is the new covenant that these prophets start to hint of in line with all these other, you know, these other covenants that God had made and the promises that God had made. How would they be worked out? And we start to see that this tension is going to be worked out through the new covenant. So again, as, as we close, tonight's message is a little bit shorter, but um, this idea of, of not just covenant consequences and not just judgment and, and, and the things that we've talked about, but also this idea of, of covenant love that God cares for a people. And, and we've seen that all the way going back, you know, from the very beginning, in, in Genesis, after the people had rebelled, after Adam and Eve had, had, had you know, followed um, and listened to the, the voice of Satan, we saw how God cared for them. He, he, did, not, um, you know, he did not destroy them, and, and time and time, even through people's sin and rebellion, we see how God comes to the rescue, how God covers over their sin temporarily, how God still loves it. And it's been a theme all the way through, but it becomes, just, you know, becomes more and more concrete. And we see through the, the words of the prophets the, the heart of our God that he loves his people. And again, this new covenant that we read about in, in several places, and there are other places as well that are hinted and, and, you know, and, and hidden in a little mystery and, and shrouded a little bit. We see, again, I want to reiterate the three components of this new covenant. God says, I will be your God. You will be my people. And I will live among you. Jesus came and he sent his spirit and and he's coming back one day. And we'll talk about that in the very last week of this, uh, of this series. But again, this idea of covenant love. So I, I just want to close with, with, a, um, with, with a verse from 2 Kings. And again, if we read through the book of you know, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, it's, it's really at a, a tough time period. I mean, in the nation, the, the kings are bad. Yeah, there's judgment coming. Things are falling apart. They're divided. Um, again, Jeremiah, he spoke into a, a horrific time, a time when his people and, and the land and they were being invaded and they were being shipped off. I mean, just a, a really tough time. But in the midst of this, I want us to understand again, as God begins to hint at this new covenant, as begin to, to make this promise of a coming king, of a Messiah who would make things right, that God would be our God and, and he would live among us. Um, we see his heart in 2 Kings chapter 13. Amongst all the chaos, amongst the, the, the consequences that have come from the people not following their end of the Mosaic Covenant, the promises from Deuteronomy chapter 28 and 18, they would be vomited out of the land, there would be chaos, there would be all kinds of things. We also read this in 2 Kings. But the Lord was gracious to them, and he had compassion and showed concern for them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To this day, he has been unwilling to destroy them or banish them from his presence. That's our God. Every right to punish his people, to give up on this, this race, this pinnacle of, of creation, mankind. 
And yet our God is a covenant God, and he's a God of love. And he cares for his people, and he always has, and he's always faithful to his word, and, and, and he loves us, and, and, and he, he wants relationship with us. And he always has. And when we reject him, it breaks his heart, as we've seen. And, and he refers to us as his bride, as his, as his spouse. And, and when we cheat on him, he feels that as, as human beings do, probably even more so than we can begin to imagine. But God loves and cares, and he provides for us. And there is one coming who is the answer to all of our problems, the answer to the sin problem that began in, in the Garden of Eden and continues on. But we, we, we know the answer, and it's all about Jesus. So next week, as we move on, we'll, we'll finish up in kind of the history section with a few books. But we're going to talk about this time between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Amazing, now gone through nine weeks. It's going to be nine or ten weeks, and we've zoomed through the 39 books um, of the Old Testament. But hopefully you've seen uh, and how it works and, and the picture and how it's arranged, and it starts to make more and more sense. But there's a time after the book of Malachi, before we get to the Gospels, where it, where it seems as if God is silent. We have no more books during about a 400-year time period um, in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, no prophets that left records for us, no, no, no um, inspired revelation that we have um, preserved for us. And a lot of times we refer to it as kind of the silent period. But I think we're going to see next week that it was by no means silent. While God didn't give us a written revelation of things that he was doing in, in, in the story during those 400 years, God was by no means silent. He was moving kingdoms and nations and principalities and people and setting up for the exact perfect time when he would send his one and only son, Jesus the Messiah, onto the scene, born of a virgin in a, in a, in a lowly situation in a stable, and he would rise to be the king of kings, the one that all of these promises are about, the answer to our sin problem. And we start to head into that section next week. So we'll talk a little bit about the time between the Old and New Testament and see how God was arranging and working for his promises and for his plan to begin to come to fruition in an amazing way, the good news of Jesus Christ. So again, hopefully this is just making a little more sense as we continue on. Hopefully it's given you a, a desire to read the scriptures for yourself and, uh, and I would encourage you as you read them in the context of, of what we've been learning, don't, don't get bogged down by the things that you don't understand. Continue to learn and to grow because honestly, the Bible, the 66 books that we have, the, the scriptures themselves say that it is the eternal word of God, that they will last forever. So I believe that we're going to be in heaven for uh, you know, millions of years and we are still going to be studying the scriptures and learning new things and seeing that God is more amazing than we ever began. So don't get bogged down by what you don't know. Don't get discouraged by what you don't know because you have eternity to figure it out, um, I think, in, in, in amazing ways. Um, and that's how deep God's word is and, and our source of truth and uh, the story of who God is and how we fit in with all that. So let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, I just, um, I'm thankful for just uh, your faithfulness. And I'm thankful for the amazing love that you show to us. And God, I'm a sinner. And I mess up often, um, and, and, and I need your help. And I know that, that I have a problem, like everyone else that I've ever laid eyes on, everyone else that's ever been born other than the one perfect God-man, Jesus Christ. And our problem is sin. And Father, you've told us all the way back in Genesis chapter 2 that where there is sin, there is death. And there is nothing we can do about that. But fortunately, God, as we're seeing, you had a plan. You were not surprised by anything that has ever taken place and you will redeem and call your people back, a, a, a people and a land and, and, a, and a kingdom that will, that will last forever. And we will be worshiping our God in our midst. We will be your people and you will be our God and, and you will reign and live with us forever. And Father, we, it is mind boggling to think how important we are to you. And so Father, I just pray that all of us, uh, as, as we humbly learn these things, that we submit to your authority, to your rule, to your kingship, to your lordship, and that our lives become more and more of the living sacrifice to our God that, that, it, that it should be and need to be. But Father, we need new hearts. We need the promise of the new covenant. We need our hearts that are, that are stoned to be turned into hearts of flesh. And, and Father, just uh, you're doing a work in us and we're thankful, but we do look forward to the day when it's completed, when Jesus Christ, your son, comes back and makes all things right. Until that day, Father, help us to faithfully follow you, to build your kingdom on earth, 
um, to, to, to point people towards your son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one that the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation are all about. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You guys have a great night.